You guys look like you're running a spread offense, the way you're all strategically placed 10 yards apart from one another. I don't know if you've been down at Holy Word Austin lately, but I've upset a few people. I put ropes on the back four pews because we do it down there too for that first service because there's only like 50 people there. So now we have to sit in front of the ropes and the same people that sat in the very back sit right in front of the ropes. But that's okay. We're glad you're here. We don't care where you sit. We just care that you listen because it's the greatest thing you can do at church involved with any church organization. The greatest thing you can ever do is listen with your heart. And that's what we're here to do for, for this morning. When our oldest was only about four, I helped coach his first soccer team. I always coached them when they were little because I didn't know much about soccer and I eased out by the time they were seven or eight. His first year in soccer, there was another little boy on his team that really had a hard time getting into the game. He really had less than mediocre skills, and he was not very motivated. Now, this isn't necessarily related, but he was from a divorced family. He had a single mom, and his father lived in town in Austin but was very, very busy, some kind of business job. I didn't really see the dad for the whole first half of the season. You know how soccer goes. You practice maybe one, two nights a week, and your games are on Saturday morning. And it wasn't until the middle of the season, this little boy, we, we had tried everything to get him to get into it, but he just really wasn't into it that much. Uh, we got to the very middle of the season, and he came one Saturday morning, and he was a different kid. He was beaming, and he acted excited to be there and wanted to play, and he said, my daddy's coming to the game today. And while we were warming up, you could tell he'd like kick the ball a little bit, and he'd watch the parking lot. And pretty soon, a, a really nice BMW pulled in, and a guy got out with a shirt and tie on a Saturday morning. You could tell he was working that day, too. And he comes over, and the boy's just jumping with excitement. And he stands by the soccer field, and the little boy runs by me. and goes, that's my dad! I thought, oh, really? That kid motored around during that game like never before and even scored a goal. It was metaphysical. It was supernatural what the presence of an approving father will do for a human being. There are people that are CEOs who tell you that even though they feel like they've conquered in their work life because their dad is not an approving dad, that they still struggle intensely inside. And all of us know what it's like. And you might be evaluating your father right now, who he was or who he is, but that's not why I brought it up. Why, well, the reason I brought it up is that you have an approving father in God. And that's what the Trinity is all about. God did not reveal himself to us as a father and a son and a Holy Spirit so we would be able to win arguments with Jehovah's Witnesses about the three in one nature of God. It's not a logical thing. It is a real spiritual, metaphysical presence in our life that God is our dad. He's not our boss. And we learn that because there's a father and a son, and the son is our brother, and he brought us into the family. And the Apostle Paul is working hard in this little section, so get your folder open to Romans 8. He's working really hard to get us to understand that and believe it so that we will, in the game of life, be all in and happy about it and be safe and be at peace. Paul wrote the Romans, a long letter, and chapter 8, which he didn't number them, but someone did later, is a long chapter. And right in the middle is this section about, we're going to read about us calling God Abba. I'm about to read it in just a minute. I want you to remember, Jesus actually called the Father Abba when he was praying in Gethsemane. We're going to talk about it and what it means for us. So get your folder open to page 4, and I'll read it again. Vicar read it a minute ago, but i got to get your mind into the paragraph. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. You could circle that word children. The Spirit who, re who you receive does not make you slaves. You could circle that, children versus slaves. So that you live in fear again, rather than 
Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship would be another thing you could circle. Children, slaves, adoption to sonship. And by him, the spirit, we cry, Abba, Father, my dad is nearby. I pray to him. He's right by my soccer field. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. There's the child word again. Now, if we're children, then also we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, our brother, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of truth that sets us free from believing that God is our boss. What is Paul saying? He's saying the Holy Spirit in your lifetime made you realize that God was your father. I don't know if you thought about it lately, but you weren't born thinking that. Paul talks about that earlier in the chapter. You were born either thinking God was this big boss, the master of the universe, far away, and everyone must give an account to him. That's called the natural knowledge of God and the law. Or you were even repressing that, toying with the idea that he doesn't even exist at all. And you're hoping he didn't because you'd have to give account for a lot. But the thought that God loved you like a dad did not occur to you until the Holy Spirit taught you that. That comes through the good news of Jesus Christ. And it got a hold of you more than once, I'm sure, and is a hold of you now. That God loves you like a father, a pure father, a perfect father loves his children. It says in the passage that he adopted us. What is an adoption? It is a legal binding statement that now that child belongs to those parents just as if he or she were born to them for the rest of their lives. When it says God adopted you in the word of God, he's trying to communicate in our language how safe you are. There's only one begotten son of God. That's Jesus. The rest of us are all adopted. But our adoption is just as if we were the begotten Son of God. God in Christ reconciled himself to the world. You might be thinking, I am sinful enough, or I've sinned enough since I've come to know about my adoption, that I think maybe God could, because he should, reject me. That's not true. He could, but he wouldn't because he won't because he's your dad. And God doesn't want guilt or shame or frustration or difficulty or struggle in your life to make you think you're outside of that relationship with him. That he's got these special people that just walk on water for him that he's close to and you're just one of these little bench warmers over there on the side. It's not true. You are his child. You are his own. He bought you with his own blood, the blood of his son. And he did not, Jesus is the one that said, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And Jesus was the son that was being given. And Jesus didn't give himself for the whole world so that one person in the world would say, I think you left me out. Ever. When you know this, when you believe this, You feel God's presence on the corner of your soccer field. When you forget this, when you get all twisted in your own thinking and you get far away from this, you start treating God more like a master or a boss. And so Paul is saying to the Romans, and he's saying to us, I need you to come back. Come back to believing that God is your dad. And he says, when we pray to him and we know he's near like that, We don't even see struggle as if he's punishing us or he's mad at us, but actually it's something that a dad is doing to to help shape us into the good that he wants us to be, and that's later in chapter 8. He says, we say to him, Abba, Father, because we're talking to our dad about whatever's going on. So here's the question. Only you can answer it. Only you really know. And maybe some of you don't even know, only God knows, and he needs to reveal it to you. 
Have you been living in your heart like God is your boss or your dad? It's very easy being religious people, people of faith, to fall into God is our the boss of the church. The, the, the Jews were doing that when Jesus showed up. And so they believed that all the non-active religious people were outside of God's adoption. And they didn't care about those people. They thought by being good, they were earning a, an adoption. And they were terrible at loving people. And Jesus was perfect at loving people. And he was out reaching out to everyone. And so he was getting criticized. So he said, he, he told the Pharisees a parable of the prodigal, what? Prodigal son, we call it. He didn't use that term. He just told the parable. Because there were two sons. One that wasted everything. You know, got, asked for half of the inheritance, took it away and wasted it in prodigal living. The other one who thought he was earning the father's love. And the parable is not really to reveal about the, the how selfish and silly the one was, but thank God he came home to Jesus. It's actually to reveal the hardness of a heart that believes, while it's being religious, that you're working for God. Because the father goes out, the, son won't, the older son won't come and celebrate when the young son comes back to his dad. And that's what made him come back. My dad is generous. The older son won't celebrate. So the father goes out, and Jesus is telling the story to change our hearts, to bring the, the brother in. He's trying to bring us into seeing him as his father, us religious people. And what does the son say, the older son? That son of yours, not that brother of mine. And he says, the older son says, I've slaved for you. Remember I said circle the word slaved in this paragraph? I slaved for you all these years and you never even gave me a banquet with a small goat. I've been working hard for you, God, and you still make me pay bills I didn't plan on. I still have uh, flooded bathrooms or I still get sick with this. I'm doing good for you, God. Oh, God's your boss now. Huh? So Jesus has the Father say, your, your brother came back, and you're my son, and everything I have is yours because I'm your father. That's the parable of the waiting father, not the prodigal son, right? The loving father. That's what Paul's getting at. That's what the Spirit teaches through the gospel that's why the Spirit testifies that you're adopted in this Word of God. He testifies to your heart you're adopted. The question is, is your heart saying it? Paul says in this thing I just read, this pa paragraph, the Spirit testifies with our spirit. My question to you as your pastor is, is your spirit testifying that you are a child of God? Believe the Gospel. And it'll be a game changer. With the way you work, with your job, the way you live in a relationship with others, parents, brother, sister, husband, wife, children. It's a game changer to believe God is your dad standing on the corner of your soccer field. It makes you live altogether different. You can tell when church folks are getting off on this because the volunteer spirit goes, and everybody's sort of like trying to avoid and get, get away from serving because it's too much. I'm not talking about any of you that if you've decided that I, I've got to organize my life. I'm talking about when you're negative and losing any joy and doing anything at all. You can tell in a couple when you're evaluating in the marriage who's really serving the best, who's really suffered the most, who's really been the better at marriage or the better at parenting. You're already falling away from the idea that it's all about grace and the father's your dad. And your joy is gone. So the gospel creates a good attitude. There was a pastor at a conference one time that I was at. This is what he said. I got a question for you. He raised his hand. If you believe in God and Christ, can you do whatever you want? Most of the pastors said, no. If you believe in Christ, you can't live however you want. The pastor said, yes, you can. Because if you believe in Christ, you want please God. Very interesting, isn't it? See, a truly good life 
is not doing the right things. A truly good life is doing the right things for the right reason. We can scare little children. You're not going to go out for recess if you don't get your work done. If you don't stand in line, then you're, you're going to be last to lunch. You, you are going to have a quiz on this. You'd better study, right? We can tell employers, empl- I mean employees, there's incentive, reward. If you will do this, this, and this, we will reward you. You can promise punishment and, or reward, and you can pe- get people to behave differently. But that doesn't mean that they're living a good life. It's even necessary in society and in family to have some rules like that just to make it, right, to get along. But that doesn't mean you've created a good life. Law with threats and rewards never creates a good life. What creates a good life is that dad standing at the corner of the soccer field. It's the love of God in Christ, which makes you want to serve him as your father. You've got to do the right things for the right reasons. Let me give you an illustration. Mother is sitting in the den. She's folding clothes. 11-year-old daughter walks through the den. Mother says, there are some dishes in the sink. Would you go and rinse them off and put them in the dishwasher? And the 11-year-old says, why do I have to, what? Do everything. And she, the daughter goes anyway and rinses the dishes off, puts them in the sink. But she's not happy. Same mother. Same daughter, 30 years later. Mother's in the den folding clothes. Daughter walks in the house. Hi, Mom! Big hug and a kiss. Walks to the kitchen, sees dishes in the sink. Starts rinsing them off and putting them in the dishwasher. Mother says, oh, honey, don't worry about those. I'll get them later. Just come and visit with me. She said, Mom, do not rob me of the joy of serving you. What's different? I know what you're thinking, maybe. 30 years is what's different. (laughs) Somehow, though, in those 30 years, she's learned to love her mom so dearly that it's a pure joy and a privilege that she doesn't have. No, she knows she's not going to have mom forever. And she loves her. And she now, as a mother herself, appreciates what mom is, right? That's doing the right thing for the right reason. It's easy to wrap your mind around this about doing good. Here's where we get surprised. It's harder to respond correctly in your soul when it's about suffering for doing the right thing. When it's just about passive obedience where you have to suffer. You see, just the fact that you're a Christian is going to make you opposite of many of the people you're around and you're going to have to suffer for that. Just to stand up for Christ, your faith to do the right thing, but also just loving difficult people is suffering. And then to do life with maybe a health problem that's not going to go away is suffering. And what the Apostle Paul is doing in his letter, in this paragraph, it's like a hinge in the chapter. He's moving towards suffering. That last part of chapter 8 is that beautiful section you've heard before that says, nothing can separate us from the love of God with persecution or sword or famine or demons or angels, nothing. It's all about trusting God through suffering. But right here is the hinge. This is when he moves into it in verse 17. So look back at the paragraph. Look at verse 17. We're almost done. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. If I could take you back to the little soccer boy, I would guess in that first half of the season there were a lot of times he wanted to quit. He he wasn't really into it. It was suffering for him. Until his dad showed up. And then what was suffering was a joy. It was an opportunity. Sometimes I want to say with Isaiah in the Old Testament said, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. This is what I want to say to God. Lord, I am a quitter, and I live among a people of quitters. Quitting is what Americans do. We have to admit that. 
58% of our marriages we quit on. Movement in jobs is the highest in the world. We've got more, I don't know statistically, but we've got more adult children who will not speak to their parents or their brothers and sisters or don't even know where they are or what's going on with them because we quit. Most men in America have one lifelong friend because they quit on them. One or the other or both. We are quitters. We are loved and we are forgiven. We don't quit as Christians. Maybe as Americans we got that in us. As sinners we have that tendency, but as, Ameri- as Christians we don't. We are co-heirs with Christ who did not quit. He didn't even quit on Judas. He loved him to the end. He loved Peter through it all. He came back after the resurrection and brought all those boys back again and again. And after he ascended and Peter was still messing up, he sent Paul and others to bring Peter back. You know why? Because he's our dad. And dad adopted us. And dad doesn't quit. And neither do his people. And we are co-heirs with Christ. Heirs of heaven. If we won't quit on earth, serving him from a, a gleeful heart of peace and grace. See, when you know God is at the corner of your soccer field and he's your dad, then service is glory. Sacrifice is a privilege. And the best thing of all is winning souls. Everything else can come and go. Amen. I'll lead us in prayer. Lord Jesus, you're our brother, Holy Spirit. You are our, our sibling, too, that brought us to faith in this Jesus and his Father. Father, God, Abba, you're our dad. We want that motivation. We want that peace. We want that joy, and we want to honor you, and we want to not quit. But this is your word, and this is our heart, and we need you to drive it home to us throughout this week. Thank you for bringing us together and helping us to listen. Amen. It's been a pleasure and a joy.